This is a book that you can use to pretty much learn complex variables. Some people think that this is pretty much the best book that you can get. And I'm gonna say that this book has everything you need for an undergraduate course in complex variables. So if you're in college and you're taking an undergrad course, this book should have everything you need. The book is called Complex Variables with an Introduction to Conformal Mapping and its Applications, and it was written by Murray R. Spiegel, PhD. This is an older edition. Let's check the copyright on it. I'm pretty sure this one is from the 90s. Yeah, this is the 32nd printing, 1989. The original printing was in 1964, so McGraw-Hill. So this has been uh, reprinted multiple, multiple times. Let's take a quick look here at the preface. The theory of functions of a complex variable, also called for brevity complex variables or complex analysis, is one of the most beautiful as well as useful branches of mathematics. Although originating in an atmosphere of mystery, suspicion, and distrust, as evidenced by the terms imaginary and complex present in the literature, it was finally placed on a sound foundation in the 19th century through the efforts of Cauchy, Riemann, Weistrass, Gauss, and other great mathematicians. And let me show you the contents. You can see it contains pretty much, I mean, just so much content there. So it starts with complex numbers, functions, limits, and continuity, complex differentiation and the Cauchy-Riemann equations, complex integration and Cauchy's theorem, Cauchy's integral formulas, and related theorems. Let's turn the page so you can see some more of the content here. Infinite series, the residue theorem, evaluation of integrals and series, conformal mapping, physical applications of conformal mapping, and special topics and an index. So the way this book works is you have some content, like it teaches you some information. You see, it just keeps going. You have more and more information, more information. It's just like information overload. Then you have solved problems. This is really key because you have actual full solutions to these problems. So it goes through and it gives you tons of solved problems. Let's see how many we get in this first chapter. So it looks like we are up to 32 so far. Okay, so 46, and then we have, oh no, so we still have some here, miscellaneous problems. Okay, I think it stops right here. So 52, so you get 52 solved problems in the very first chapter. Okay, so now if we look here, supplementary problems, these are extra problems that you also have answers to. That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty insane. And how many do we get here? Wow. Well, I guess you don't get answers to all of them. You get answers to some of them, right? So, yeah, some of them have answers. Not all of them do. Like, for example, some of these proofs uh, don't have answers, like this proof here. Prove that on the circle, z equals r e to the i theta, uh, where the modulus of e to the i z is equal to that. So uh, that you don't have an answer for. Same thing, the proof here, you don't, they don't give you an answer. So they don't give you answers for proofs, but that's okay. I mean, what they do give you is a lot. Um, so yeah, and that was chapter one. Chapter two is on function, limits, and continuity. Let's take a look at this. Variables and functions. A symbol such as z, which can stand for any one of a set of complex numbers, is called a complex variable. Okay, that's the definition of a complex variable. If to each value which a complex variable z can assume there corresponds one or more values of a complex variable w, so notice it says one or more values. Uh, when, you, when you deal with uh, real numbers, you don't, you don't allow this. We say that w is a function of z and write w equals f of z. The variable z is sometimes called an independent variable, right? While w is the dependent variable because it will depend on z, right? That's, what, that's why w is called the dependent, right? w equals f of z, so the value of w depends on z. The value of a function at z equals a is often written f of a. Thus, if f of z equals z squared, then f of 2i is, for example, negative 4. And here it talks about single and multi-value functions. It says, if one and only one value of w corresponds to each value of z, we say that w is a single-valued function of z, or that f of z is single-valued. If more than one value of w corresponds to each value of z, we say that w is a multiple-valued or many-valued function of z. Yeah, so this is something that's new 
uh, for people when they first see complex variables, and it does make it a, a harder, I think. Um, so yeah, it does it does make it a little bit more complex. Huh, that's not supposed to be funny, but yeah. <laughs> a multiple valued function can be considered as a collection of single valued functions, each member of which is called a branch of the function. It is customary to consider one particular member as a principal branch of the multiple valued function, and the value of the function corresponding to this branch as the principal value. That's key, right? That's key. Here's an example of w equals z squared. Let me zoom in here so you can see. Then to each value of z, there is only one value of w. Hence, w is a single-valued function. Now, if w equals z to the one-half, then to each value of z, there are two values of w. Hence, w is a multi-valued function. Whenever we speak of function, we shall, unless otherwise stated, assume single-valued function. Okay, so that's just some clarification there and it goes on to define some other things you've got trig functions here hyperbolic functions of a complex variable and you've got solve problems here again let's see how many we have in chapter two should have quite a few as well chapter two is harder so you might have less i'm, I'm assuming we're going to have less i don't know exactly how many there are but there's probably a lot less well actually 46 so what was the last time 52 i think so yeah, yeah, not not a huge, uh, still pretty impressive that they gave us that many. And then, of course, you have the supplementary problems, and then you have answers to some of these. Let's see how many we have here. Let's check this out. Pages are old. And it looks like we got 151 problems. I'm sorry, I have to give it a whiff here. It's just calling me. Ah, smells amazing. Chapter three is on the Cauchy, uh, complex differentiation and the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So this is, again, stuff you study in a typical undergrad um, intro course. It talks about analytic functions, Cauchy-Riemann equations, harmonic functions, and then some more stuff here. Lots of formulas here. Look at that. Wow. That's a lot of formulas. Quite a few, quite a few. And then we have solve problem. Let's see how many they give us in chapter three in terms of solve problems. Mm, looks like they give us 42, 42 solve problems. That's pretty good. And again, supplementary problem. Oh, the supplementary problems continue. Yeah, so it's just a continuation. They don't start at one again. <laughs> so I might have misspoken earlier. Yeah, just all kinds of mathematics. Oh, infinite series, I have to give it a whiff. Ah, uh, yeah, this is cool. Oh, Laurent's theorem. These are cool, Laurent series. Usually you have to find, usually you have an annulus and it converges inside the annulus. Say, what's an annulus? Let me show you. Let me show you really quick, why not? An annulus is basically something like this. So it's like a disc, it's like a, it's like an open disc with a hole. It's called an annulus. So you look at these infinite series, these Laurent series, and they converge uh, typically inside some type of annulus, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. This is something that's typically not covered in the first course. You just, you just never have time, right? And it's, uh, so typically it's not taught. Um, you might learn it in a second course or in grad school. But yeah, pretty cool book. Hey, if you want to learn math, I do have courses. Check them out. They're on Udemy. But if you get them, use my links on mathsorcerer.com. So check those out. And if you want to subscribe, go for it. Subscribe. Yep. Pretty cool book. I like it. I will uh, I'll try to remember to leave a link in the description. It's definitely available. Like it's been reprinted a gazillion times. It's not like a rare book or anything. But uh, it's one that's worth having if you... Um, are taking the class or want to learn complex variables on your own uh, or if you just even if you've already taken it, it's a great reference uh, i definitely recommend this book to everyone who studies math or complex variables it's kind of like it's one of those must-have books it's also really inexpensive because it's a shams so shams usually are not expensive which is kind of nice yeah and to learn this stuff by the way the prereq would be uh some calculus uh you, you need to know about partial derivatives and then you're good because there's some partial differentiation when you study the cauchy riemann equations so as long as you know some calc 3 uh you're okay but 
Honestly, even if you didn't, as long as you knew some calculus, you could probably learn the partial differentiation on the spot because it's really easy. Uh, and then you can just focus on the material. But having proof writing is probably the biggest thing, right? Because there are proofs in this book. And if you take a course on complex variables, you also have to write proofs. So having some knowledge of proof writing uh, would help you quite a bit. Anyways, until next time, keep doing math.